and we have an exciting evening today. We, we have two remarkable superstars, one who is in Europe right now and one from uh, New York upstate. And we're gonna be talking about the topics of uh, mentorship uh, and uh, Ali being an ally. So our first presenter is um, Dr. Gambier. He is one of our um, counselors in our chapter. And he's an assistant professor and in the Division of Hospital Medicine at SUNY Upstate. And um, he also is the Associate Program Director of the Internal Medicine Program. In addition to that, he's the Associate Vice Chair for Quality Improvement. Um, and he's um, our newest co-chair of the Early Career Task Force with Dr. Sigar. And he has a special interest in improving communications between physicians and patients. And I actually met uh, Dr. Gambier at a leadership uh, meeting when I gave an elevator pitch about me wanting to start a women in medicine series. And he came up to me and he told me about his amazing residents and what they were doing in women in medicine. And he is the ultimate he for she. So I turn it over to Dr. Gambier to start our evening off. Thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Sagar, and thank you, Karen and NYACP. Um, are you able to hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about mentorship and allyship and he for she. Uh, I have no disclosures um, and my talk will talk will be overview will be mentorship, impact of mentorship and allyship and he for she. Uh, before I dive into mentorship, I want to share a few words so that we are all on the same page. Uh, a mentor is a professional who's experienced and trusted advisor. And mentee, we, we understand, is, a, is the individual who we are advising and giving and training in. Uh, a coach is a very uh, specialized trainer and um, who is goal-oriented, task-oriented, and makes sure that the mentee or the individual reaches his fullest potential, his or her fullest potential, to achieve that task. An executive sponsor, he, um, he's a senior stakeholder, he or she, uh, in, uh, in the organization to support uh, the mentee. And uh, they put their uh, professional worth and reputation behind the mentee to make sure they are successful. And the mentor has a two-way relation a coach may have a one-way relation and a sponsor will generally have a two-way relation. Um, so before, and so this were a few words I wanted to make sure everybody is familiar with. Now, uh, before we describe, discuss about mentorship, I wanted to see what my colleagues think about mentorship. Uh, I hope this works. Um, uh, if you can uh, type in, by my name and text me, uh, your responses will start showing up here. And if it doesn't work, please feel free to use the chat box and Dr. Lee and Dr. Sagar can help me out to see what responses we are getting. But it should, it, hopefully this works. I'll give 30 seconds to see if it works. It's Harveer Gambi. That's the best name they gave me, 104. So let me know if you guys, if you're able to text it, otherwise we will, oh, great, it's working. Yeah, it looks like it works, Javier. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Amazing. So guidance, giving advice, support, relationship, that's great. Promotion, great. Relationship, goal-oriented, great. Mm 
So as we get similar responses, the most number of responses will grow in size, uh, which looks like we are in relationship multiple. Right? Guidance. Guidance. Multiple honesty help. Thank you for giving this one. Thank you for sharing your, your insight. Uh, so let's put it all together. So mentorship is a dynamic relationship and a partnership between a mentor and a mentee. And they work very closely and collaboratively towards a structured, well-defined mutual goals so that to ensure that the mentee's professional growth and success is certain and definite. Uh, so it's, for, in my perspective, it is like a process and it is intentional and we nurture them and is insightful. So I am, um, to share that I'm an associate program director. So when I meet with my mentees and the most common thing I hear is how to fellowship. And so I feel it's my responsibility to share my experiences. And even though I'm not any fellowship, but what I have seen, share my stories and give them tips and guidance to ensure they understand the full process and they have all opportunities, giving them suggestions about when to write, write their personal statement, what to, should they have, letter of recommendation, who should they ask, when they should, which conferences they should and how should they put their CV. So in a full way, mentoring them to make sure they achieve their goal. And, and it's, it's, it's two-way relationship and always providing them feedback and always being available to them and uh, making sure that the journey is heading in the right direction. Uh, now, when we talk about mentorship, there are things come about, a uh, few words come out, coaching, sponsorship. So I just want to clarify and define these things, but these are very important uh, things which will come in the journey in academic medicine. Now, teaching is um, sharing of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, coaching is, uh, it's, a, it's a very, I have discussed task oriented, very uh, goal oriented, and you will, the mentor will give, the, the person will give you instructions so that you achieve your task. Uh, so for example, uh, I am going to ACLS course, and uh, the instructor will give me instructions, very specific, so that I can become an ACL certified instructor. So very goal oriented, and I achieve my goal. And mentorship, as I discussed, as a, as a mentee, when they come to me about fellowship, we discuss about things in, in detail. It's a longitudinal process, it continues process, and we, we have a structure, we have definition, we have goals. Now, sponsorship is very important. Um, and I think everybody should have an executive sponsor. So sponsorship is that uh, as, a men, as, a, as, a, as a senior leader or a senior leadership, you put all your professional worth, your reputation behind the mentee to ensure they get every chance of success and opportunity to achieve their goal. And to understand that, uh, you know, I think, uh, Two of my uh, now their chief residents, uh, uh, they are they they had a brilliant idea of woman in residency. What Dr. Lee pointed out, and uh, they started this full project on their own, and they had mentioned to me. Um, so and then it was my I, I felt it's my responsibility and sponsor for them to make sure they get all the opportunities for that to move forward. Uh, so it's making sure they are on the right path. Uh, that's sponsorship. Now, there are different models of mentorship, uh, which is one of traditional when, you know, one-to-one, -one, there's a senior faculty who joins the junior faculty or the senior resident joins the junior resident. And they give guidance, they give uh, tips so that they can advance career. Very important is peer group mentoring, where a group of individuals come together and share their successes, their stories, sometimes their failures, 
and lessons learned and they try to mentor each other. That's, this is a very important peer mentoring and everybody should have that. Meet the professor, give you an example, like uh, in, our, in, in our institute, we had this academic of career of fair. So we had uh, multiple professors from, or associate professor from different specialty. They came to one hall and one table and the resident went to them. They could took advice which fellowship should they should take. So it's a session, it's a short term, uh, they can have follow up if they share their email ID or their thoughts. Uh, and then what is speed mentoring? So speed mentoring is I was in the process of having my academic promotion. Now I was not aware or familiar what how to proceed. So I contacted the Dean's education office, my promotion committee, and I had sessions shared my CV, got feedback, got some teaching, got some mentoring, and then I applied. So that's speed mentoring. Now, if one size doesn't fit all, that means maybe mentees' needs are different and they, they vary. So maybe we need multiple mentors. So that's where we come to this developmental mentor network. So that means we may have multiple mentors for, for their different needs. So it's important every mentee should have this mentoring network because they could be different domains and each domain may have a different mentor. That, that's absolutely fine and that's that we should all think about these things. So, if, so every mentee should have, can have multiple mentors so that they can progress in their journey. Now, what is an effective mentor? So effective mentor um, is I think once we commit as a mentor, we should be easily available, accessible and approachable so that the mentee feels there's no hesitation from their end that should I, should I contact even for a small question. And they should have a defined structure and mutual goals. There should be a vision. And not only we should be supportive in words, but we're supporting in listening and actions. And the most important part, which I feel is giving timely and constructive feedback, which is, which I, I, I prefer them is sometimes it's called tough love is very important to under, make them understand what, what direction they're heading if there is something in the wrong direction and also encouraging them, celebrating them, how they are doing well. And it should be always a two-way street communication. So that's very important. Now, how does mentorship impact in our academic medicine? So it, it helps in personal growth and development that leads to professional development and promotion that creates positivity and creativity, productivity, and also engagement from the mentee and also empowerment. This will help in their job satisfaction. This will help in wellness. This will help in, of, in retention of that mentee for a, maybe a full-time faculty. And we all are not all talking about wellness. So this is very important for wellness also. Now, this will directly or indirectly help in a better work culture, a better work environment, and this will also help in bridging the gaps in race and in gender biases. So overall, this will lead to a better health system, better outcome, and also will impact better patient care and outcomes. So mentoring is very crucial in academic medicine. Now, now to dive into what is important is allyship, he for she. I'm sure everybody has seen Harry Potter. Uh, Emma Watson in 2015, in March, she invited men to stand together for a, a massive movement of gender equality. That means that not even just the head count should be equal, but also we should have equal opportunities, equal resources, and we should stand together to fight this. It is not just our woman colleagues, but it's, it's both in this and together. And this, now this, how does this go into academic medicine? Now, um, from Association of American Medical Colleges, there was an executive summary and a survey done, which says the state of women in academic medicine 2018 and 2019. 
Now, I'm going to share some tables from that so that we understand how this, what were the data. So uh, I think if literature is very evident, there is a pay difference between our women colleagues and men colleagues. Um, and also, if you see that the leadership roles, uh, majority are by men as opposed as compared to women colleagues. And when we talk about workplace equity, 17% um, women colleagues felt disrespected as compared to one at workplace. And also 65% of women faculty said they don't have equal opportunities as compared to 85%. So there, is, there are gaps which we should acknowledge uh, and we should come together. Now, taking as an overview, um, we know that more of our women colleagues are joining medical school. So that is excellent. Now, as they have this journey in their, in their academia, you see only the percentage where they become chairs and deans and C-suite is only 18 to 16%. It seems like there's a leaky pipeline and why that is so. I think we should also look in that perspective. So, so we acknowledge there are gaps in opportunities, pay and respect and safety. Now, there are multiple factors, but I just wanted to have few factors which are leading to these gaps. One is I think there is a, a big lack of mentorship and sponsorship to our women colleagues. And there are implicit biases and there are stereotyping and microaggressions. And also there are implicit biases about where our women colleagues have to have always have this tug of war when they start their families and when, how will it affect their professional career. So there are multiple factors, but I think these were something to mention. Now, how can we, as we can come together and become an ally and stand together to make sure there is gender equality and equity? Equality means, again, not just the head counts, but having equal opportunities, equal resources, equal pay, they, we both feel safe at the and we both feel respected the same way. So that's gender equality and how to have gender equity. So we should, all should strive for fairness and justice so that we both are in the same journey, have the same structure for promotion and everything should be very transparent. So what we can do. So when I was making this presentation, I um, thought of, in the morning, we can master this. Uh, and, you know, ma I'm just going to master this mentorship uh, and A is for advocate and amplify as is standing together, sharing and support. T, T is for teach, train and team. E is for engage, empower. R is for respect and recognize. Now, if you put it all together, so if, if we are in a leadership position and we have an opportunity to mentor, then we should become the, the mentor. We should become the sponsor. We should make sure, we should make sure if there is some microaggression, we should stand up and say, this is intolerant, this is ground zero. Now, if there are a woman colleague which are expressing some ideas and so, and it in a meeting and we come to know that they don't get the due care, we should make sure they get the due care. We should make sure that they are on the table. We should make sure they are inclusive. We should make sure that they are recognized, they are celebrated, and they are honored. So this we can do, and it is very important. We recognize that. We talk about it. We are more aware of this, uh, so that we can come together. Now, at an organization standpoint, we need strong leadership, which should be inclusive of our women colleagues. That will help to lead the change culture which is needed. We should also think about in a bigger way about changing some policies which are friendly to families uh, so that they don't have to have this battle which they go when to start their professional life, when to plan family. This is more important. This should be at the institute level. Also important is to have mentorship programs for faculty, both for men and women, both, because it's important that they get the 
training so they can become the next generation leaders because academic medicine is treating patients by researching by clinical care and by developing next generation leaders and also educating about biases that should be training so that we can mitigate about these biases and the last which is measurement that means that every year everything we should see how have we done have we moved the needle or we just the same status quo so to end i will say this is the right thing to do i would uh, i see uh, we have few men colleagues and i have a lot of women colleagues so we should all come together to stand for gender equality and equity so that we can make a change uh, at this i would like to end my presentation and thank my wife and my son for the tremendous support and dr sagar and dr lee uh, miss karen and also dr goodman for her feedback and i share uh, a small point which you know if you want to have to grow for you know, have hundred is a prosperity you should grow people so that is by mentoring thank you and uh, i'm more than happy to have any questions or discussion or feedback Wow, thank you, Javier. That was really inspiring. And thank you for this shout out. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, really uh, amazing quote. And I think um, I wish people could meet Javier in person because he is the ultimate he for she and uh, um, the way he supported his residents uh, through this project of women in medicine was really, quite remarkable and I wish we could clone you. <laughs> um, so I think what we'll do is we'll save all the questions for the end and I will introduce our next speaker. We have a very special guest. It's um, Dr. Tiffany Leong. She is, comes all the way from Netherlands, broadcasting from ne Netherlands. She's an internist, uh, an assistant professor um, at uh, the Medicine and Life Sciences at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. She previously was a primary care physician in the US and uh, has a lot of experience in telemedicine. If you are active in SGIM, I'm sure you know her well. She is the co-producer of the DEI Shift podcast, which I hope you're all listening to, amazing podcast. She is also um, a steering committee member of our newest Asian, um, Asian affinity uh, group, and also is part of uh, the Women's Wellness Through Equity and Leadership Program Scholar. So um, I feel like she and I are simpatico, even though we've never met in person, I feel like we know a lot of people in common and we share a lot of similar um, goals. So I welcome uh, Dr. Leong. She's gonna be talking to us about why our words matter and sponsorship through unbiased letter writing. So welcome. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation to join you all today. And thank you all for taking time out of your evenings, which are surely evenings, which are surely quite busy um, to be able to join today. So I'm just going to go ahead and start my presentation here and share my screen, hopefully, with you all. All right, how's that for all of you? OK, Looks super. Good. So um, this is my university campus or part of it. Uh, and right behind it, you can see a little bit of the hospital, which I've been spending a lot of my time in lately. Um, but anyway, so we'll jump right into this because of what I really hope to do for all of you is to give you some actionable points that you can take away from today to be able to incorporate into any letter or evaluation writing that you might be doing in the near future. 
So this is to build a little bit more on what uh, Dr. Singambir just presented, specifically along the lines of sponsorship and a little bit about what we can do about addressing implicit bias as it appears in our language. So these are objectives for today to recognize bias language first and then to identify ways to make improvements. So uh, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the Women in Medicine website on the ACP, um, this uh, resource is one of many curated resources on that webpage. If you're not familiar with it yet, I encourage you to do so. Um, this is just one of many uh, podcasts, uh, articles, recorded videos, webinars, and so on that can be incredibly helpful and informative as you're learning more about how you can uh, make your mark and help out with achieving uh, gender equity in medicine. And the reason I included this particular one is that uh, writing letters of support to overcome gendered language and expectations is in fact one of the top 10 in terms of sponsorship uh, for tips to impact gender equity. So that's what today is all about. Um, so why do we care about writing high quality letters? We already, I already mentioned about letters of recommendation. That's quite obvious in terms of looking for jobs, but performance evaluations also is a part of that, uh, especially in 360 degrees. So this applies to pretty much everyone across the uh, career spectrum in medicine. And then a variety of other things. So grant applications, you need letters of recommendation, awards and recognition. There are letters of nomination that are involved even promoting within your organization to a leadership role, that's also relevant here. So there are a variety of different reasons that being able to uh, write good quality letters that are unbiased with respect to gendered language is incredibly important. Um, so at this stage, uh, Karen, would you mind putting up that one poll question that I've got? So I just wanna get a sense from the audience have you ever written a performance evaluation or a letter of recommendation support or nomination? Please take a moment to say yes or no to that question. And I see a couple of yeses popping into the chat. Thanks for that. And Karen, when you're ready. Oh, wow. Okay. So 89%. Great. I expected that. I actually expected hopefully 100%. Uh, I will be curious if those who are falling in the 11% might be able to share their uh, perspectives after this presentation as well, whether this still is helpful for them. Um, okay. So great. So this applies to almost everyone in the room. So that's great. So here we go. So why do letters matter? Um, they are used as an important early stage selection tool for qualified candidates for whatever the purpose may be. So where does gendered language come from? It comes from the implicit biases that we all carry. If you haven't heard it before, it's important to acknowledge that uh, we all have them. Uh, for, no, for us to have zero biases is just not possible. And so the idea is to be able to be self-aware and recognize that we have them um, and to be able to make sure that we're able to take measures to be able to address them. Uh, and in this case, in writing. But where else does gendered language come from and uh, why does it matter in this particular task? Um, this concept of gender schemas uh, is the implicit or non-conscious hypothesis about sex differences that can play a central role in the advancement um, of men's and women's professional lives. And so this is important not only for the writing task, but also for the reading task. And so that's not something that I'm gonna cover so much today, but for those of you who are in leadership roles or for example, on hiring committees um, who may be reading letters and making decisions about candidates, this can also be incredibly relevant to be able to recognize potentially implicit, uh, implicitly biased language in letters that you read. So where do we see gendered language? So, 
there are studies that exist that have examined this precise question in medicine across the spectrum. So we've talked about some examples, but specifically where there's evidence, which I'll try to summarize for you very quickly today, um, is students applying for residency programs. Um, letters of recommendation for uh, applicants to academic faculty positions, whether that's in science or medicine, evaluations by faculty of residents and students, and as I mentioned, 360 degree evaluations exist and are pretty widely accepted, so student, resident, and fellow evaluations of faculty, and unfortunately, gendered language persists in all of these. So what can you do? So I really want to spend some time here as to what are the specific things that you can take away from today to be able to start thinking about and apply right away in your next writing task when you're sponsoring a candidate or a mentee or protege. I'm going to spend most of my time in the next 10 minutes or so talking about these two, avoiding stereotypes and doubt raising language, because I think they tend to fly under the radar much more often. Um, as I mentioned, increasing self-awareness about your implicit biases is something that if you just ha have to recognize that we have them, but what do you do about it, I think is the actionable part. And then focusing on accomplishments and providing specific examples, I think are also quite self-explanatory, but I'll touch on each of these anyway. If you haven't already seen the implicit association test from Harvard, I encourage you to do so. Um, there are a variety of different tests that you can take to be able to assess and reflect on your own implicit biases that exist. I won't spend a lot more time on this, but feel free to scan the QR code here real quick, or you can always just do an internet search uh, for the Harvard Implicit Bias Association test. So the second part, like I mentioned, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, avoiding stereotypes. So stereotypes, of course, can be based on any characteristic, not just by gender. Today, I'll focus more on gender than anything else. Um, there, that is actually where most of the evidence lies, as I had mentioned before. So on the left-hand side here, you see what's called communal adjectives and the right side, agentic adjectives. If you take a browse through these adjectives uh, that were used in letters of recommendation for academic faculty applicants, you might be able to get a sense of which column might apply more often to female candidates versus male candidates. And you see maybe a couple of nodding heads uh, in the screens here, in our, our Brady Bunch screen. So um, just to confirm what you're probably already thinking, the left side uh, about being uh, affectionate, uh, helpful, kind, sympathetic, and so on, those tend to be more often applied to women Whereas the agentic adjectives of being assertive, confident, ambitious, independent, these more, are more often applied to male candidates applying for faculty positions. There's a lot more uh, from the other articles that I mentioned before as well, in terms of how you can look at gendered language and how it appears. So just to summarize, uh, on the left side, you sort of see for female applicants or physicians, um, more often you, see, you hear these sort of vague, positive general terms, caring and nurturing words, which also reflect the communal adjectives that you saw in the last slide, more emotive terms like being empathic and warm. That particularly appeared in evaluations of faculty by students, residents, and fellows. And interestingly, something called grindstone words for women, which are words that comment upon the work ethic of the individual. So that they're hardworking, dedicated, conscientious. And normally we would think that, oh, is, that's not so bad to say that somebody's hardworking. Um, but depending on the context, it can actually, for example, imply that they're incredibly hardworking and have this strong work ethic. Is it because that there's some, there's some sort of shortcoming that they're trying to overcome? Um, and so in all these cases on this left side column, all of these do tend to happen more often for women than for men, about two to three times as common as men. Um, but it's not to say it doesn't happen for men as well. Uh, likewise, on the right side, again, the trend is that the standout adjectives, achievement and ability terms, they're more often applied to men than women, even though, again, there is overlap. So what does that look like? I feel like I just gave you a whole list of words. And so what does it look like in context and how do you recognize it? That's what I set out as one of the learning objectives. 
So from this article, um, there are some good examples and you might be able to pull some examples from letters you've seen or maybe that you've written yourself and I encourage you to do so maybe to do that reflective exercise after this to be able to look and see where you might have some improvements to make. Um, so Dr. Harvey has been very successful in obtaining grants from such and such developed excellent clinical trials group these all sound wonderful and positive our specific focused achievements and accomplishments that's great to write. Uh, it would be greater, it would be wonderful to be able to see this done universally for all candidates, doesn't matter regard, regardless of the gender. So Dr. Gray, excuse me, is a caring, compassionate physician with excellent interpersonal relationships. That sounds great, um, but also it sort of fits that trend of the more communal adjectives as well as the nurturing terms that are used. And again, I should emphasize, this is not to say you shouldn't use them. I think if the idea here is to ensure that you are equitable in their application to men and women or uh, an individual of any gender background. So here are some examples from another article. This, in this case, it's evaluations of uh, surgical residents. So you can start to browse some of these excerpts and get an idea which ones apply to male or female residents. Some of the pronouns give it away for a couple of them, but you can get a sense that, for example, solid, consistent work with no fuss, interacts with everyone in a pleasant demeanor and never seems to get upset or angry. Um, always smiling, hardworking, pleasant. These are all more typically for women than for male physicians. Um, so what do you do, wanna do about it? <clears throat> One of the things that you can do is to avoid gratuitous mentions of applicants, gender, or race. Um, so some of these examples might seem a little bit outdated. I really hope that they are. This particular article, as you can see, was published in 2003 based on letters from 1995. So I hope that these days we wouldn't see the first couple or even all of these bullet points saying things like, Dr. X is entirely dedicated to patient care, personable, and a gentleman in every sense of the word. <laughs> um, or so-and-so is the quintessence of the contemporary lady physician. Um, I think these just kind of make you want to chuckle and really like cringe a bit, <laughs> to be totally honest. Um, but like I said, um, gratuitous mentions uh, can always be avoided as can be any mentions of other aspects of a patient's uh, individual characteristics or intersectional identities. They're typically not relevant for the candidate's capabilities when you're trying to write a letter of support for them. So just be mindful of that. And if you're already doing it and avoiding doing this, wonderful. The last thing also here uh, is consideration of first name usage. It does tend to hop happen more often for men than for women. Um, but I would just say, just as in our spoken language, which is being done more often in committees and, you know, grand rounds, presentation introductions, and so on, the best practice and the universal uh, rule of thumb would be just to apply doctor as the title for all genders. I think you can't go wrong in doing that, and it's just an easy principle to follow. The potential is that if you use first names because you're expressing familiarity, that may or may not be interpreted that way by the person who's reading the letter because all they see is the letter. They're not talking to you directly or talking to the candidate directly yet, most often. Usually the letters are seen before uh, a committee will see the, the, the resident or the applicant. So that was stereotyping language. And I'll try to pick this up a little bit because I wanna leave some time for any questions and discussion. Um, so doubt raising language is sort of an interesting category of things uh, that can appear in letters and evaluations. So doubt is an extended category of negative language. And I think this sort of insidiously sneaks into our uh, writing and we might not even realize it. Um, so that includes things like tentative words where someone might be able to do something or it's possible that they could do something. Um, and there are specific categories if you want to get to it. So overtly negative language or potentially negative language uh, appears in this category of doubt raisers. Things that are sort of stated but incompletely explained um, or sort of praise but kind of weak, faint praise, not something that's really strong and assertive and clear. Um, and then hedges. So 
uh, it appears that her health and personal life are stable. I would say that probably also falls into the category of maybe unexplained and irrelevant as well. Um, so there's not a clear uh, line dividing these different categories of speech or writing. The main idea here is just to be able to recognize that doubt raising language is present. Um, how often does it occur? Here you sort of get a sense that again, doubt raising language appears uh, twice as often as for uh, male physicians letters. And on average, there are more of those kinds of statements. Um, so what do you want to do about it? You state assertions, as I mentioned, and be very clear about what it is that you're endorsing about the candidate in writing and not doubts. And so this could be as simple as Dr. X is committed to this field of research rather than they appear to be committed to this research, which is doubt raising language. So what are examples? Great resident, they have the potential to succeed. Uh, they will prove themselves an excellent, they will prove themselves as an excellent researcher and teacher rather than they are, or they seem to be well grounded for an intern in the first rotation. This might be a good one to keep in mind given our new academic year that just started. Um, and I believe so and so is concerned and interested, who offers excellent patient care and tries hard to communicate with patients and physicians. So I think that leaves some questions as well as uh, some, some doubt there. So focusing on accomplishments and providing specific examples, uh, I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail, but this is actually just a repurposing of that previous uh, example from the publication about Dr. Harvey versus Dr. Gray. Um, and the idea is that I think the language is good. I think it just needs to be applied universally to all candidates that you're writing about and sponsoring for whatever the purpose may be. So what can you do? Um, we, I covered these five things, focusing primarily on the second and third items. So in summary, for avoiding stereotypes, you wanna avoid gratuitous mentions of individual characteristics, including gender and race. Um, you wanna be aware of words that reinforce, potentially reinforce stereotypes, like using the caring, emotive, nurturing and grindstone language about women versus the standout achievement and ability oriented terms for men. The idea would be that that should apply universally for all candidates that you write about. Um, and avoid using doubt raising language. So the hedging, the faint or weak praise, uh, things that are completely irrelevant to the purpose of the letter and language that can be potentially or is negatively, uh, negatively written or unexplained. And then there were the last couple of things I mentioned about universally using doctor instead of first, uh, first names in reference to individuals. Um, and then uh, I didn't mention it before, but also using the pronoun of preference of the individual candidate, I think would be incredibly important as well. So this is my last slide. Here are my references uh, for today's talk, which I tried to batch into these very compacted tables of uh, words that you've seen today. And I'll just leave you with some uh, information here. You can certainly get in touch with me if you have any follow-up questions or thoughts or additional experiences, um, I'm open to that. Um, we, uh, I should say, uh, I was on a committee for the American Medical Informatics Association, the Subcommittee on Awards and Leadership, um, which uh, put together this tip sheet on writing award nomination letters specifically, uh, but the principles are quite similar to everything that I've mentioned today. And some of the references that I listed on the last slide are also there. Um, some of these other sort of interesting tools that you can sort of play around with, like this thing, benschmidt.org, um, uh, it actually involves, basically you can look up a particular noun or adjective or word and see it applied to um, teaching evaluations across different disciplines, including health sciences. So it's sort of fun to play with. It doesn't really help you really specifically with writing a letter, but it's an interesting uh, thing that exists out there. And then if you're a Slack user, uh, you can actually download this interesting plugin to be able to real time suggest alternative uh, words in your written language in Slack um, to be able to mitigate bias in your written language as well. Uh, I will leave you with the ACP Women in Medicine resource because that is, uh, again, as I mentioned, an incredibly valuable uh, curated set of resources on gender equity and I'll stop there so that way we can talk some more and um, discuss and have some questions. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Leung. Um, I think um, Dr. Sigar was uh, watching our chat. So maybe um, do you want to shout out some of the questions that were mentioned? Yes. So I think there's a couple of questions that came in through the chat and probably this might be best um, if folks feel, feel free to unmute and ask questions, but I can get us started. So one of the questions, I think this can go for both of you guys actually as speakers, what is one or two action items that you would recommend that each of us can start implementing tomorrow? So I'll give it to Dr. Singh Gambier first and then Dr. Leon. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, two main things which I would suggest is being collaborative and getting inclusive when you go tomorrow to work. So getting uh, our women colleagues on the table because their perspective is very different and critical. Uh, and to, to ensure that uh, we are working as a team. So that two important aspects will actually on tomorrow if we are going to. But I think this, to just be, take one second more, if, if uh, the question is from Dr. Narsikul, I would I will request to maybe think about starting a mentorship program uh, uh, because that's which will be helpful for all of us uh, as, an, as, as faculty and even if any institute having a mentorship program because I was, when I was reviewing this, uh, I think John Hopkins, Dressler, and, and uh, University of Wisconsin, they have developed a mentorship program for both men and women, mm -hmm. and they have seen uh, a trajectory which is different from other institutes. Thank you. Great, and Dr. Liang? Uh, yeah, I mean, I hope um, those two main things that I mentioned about avoiding stereotyping language and avoiding doubt raising language will be something that at least those things, if you can remember those the next time that you are writing a letter of recommendation, a letter of nomination, or uh, a performance evaluation, which I imagine will be coming up very soon in the near future for those of you who supervise, uh, you know, interns, residents, and students. Um, please just keep those things in mind. I think those are things you can do right away. If you would like to take the time to do some self-reflection in terms of looking back at any evaluations and letters you have written, I would certainly encourage you to take the time to do so. Um, it is definitely one of these sort of interesting exercises uh, that I've tried also to, to look back and sort of see what exactly was I saying and what did I intend with how I said that? Um, and I think it's just, you know, one of those things that if you see it and you see that you've done it and an implicit bias has sort of snuck its way into what you wrote, it can be actually the, the most important thing that cues you to minimize the chances that that's gonna happen in the future. Um, I, I mentioned that I'm on, or had been on the um, subcommittee for awards and leadership in uh, AMIA. And uh, one of the sets of panels that we had done at one of the conferences last, last year was actually involved a panelist who basically did a text analysis of his own letters over a period of three decades. So he had over 200 letters and basically text analyzed his own letters. I'm not telling you that to do it that way, but if that's your thing and you have the skills to do so, by all means, please feel free to do so. But it was really interesting because he shared his results and indeed he found that there were some, uh, some areas where some implicit bias did sneak into his uh, letters where he'd say like, oh, um, female physician so-and-so brightens the room when she walks in or things like that, which you're just like, really? Wow, did I actually write that? And I think that was his reaction when he did that, uh, looking back at his own letters. So I hope that, um, yeah, in addition to avoiding stereotyping language, avoiding doubt raising language, you can maybe take some time to reflect on your own writing in the past. Okay. And then I think the other question was actually from me. And my question for both of you was, especially when you are a student or a resident or a fellow and you're kind of in this hierarchy of 
requesting a letter or requesting somebody to be a mentor, often women in medicine may feel a little more hesitant and may, may be given the implicit recommendation to ask only certain people for the letter or how do you go about recommending asking somebody to be a mentor or asking somebody to write a letter for you? I can take a quick stab at that. I actually, I was just reading a, something earlier um, and I like this quote, which is that the answer to an unanswered question is always, uh, sorry, the answer to an unasked question is always no. And so I think if you really want something uh, or you are, think something is very valuable or important for your career progression or advancement, ask. The worst that happens is you get a no, but you get a no anyway if you don't ask. Uh, I completely agree. I always uh, have this, there should be no hesitation to ask a question and there is no question, a silly question. There's a, every time the question is important, and at the journey, if you're a medical student, right? and if you don't ask, there's no point. The answer maximum will be no. So there's no, there's no loss. But if you don't ask, in sitting in that cloud, whether should I or should I not, will make, if I you talk about, will make more anxiety and more, will be feeling more clustered. And that will lead to, I will say, that's not balance, if, to put it. You should ask, it doesn't matter. This is Sri Narsenberg talking um, from Syracuse. I'm the chair of medicine and I like that quote very much. Um, in fact, I could simplify it with my faculty. I just say the answer to every question is no. No, I'm kidding about that. That's not what I say. But I, I do have a question for Dr. Leong um, who emphasized the importance of language and letters. I just wanted to extend that a little bit in day-to-day -day life about something that I feel really uncomfort uncomfortable around, and that's when women refer to other women as girls or girlfriends. And this happens all the time when people talk about the girls in the front office or you know that kind of phraseology. How do you handle that? I mean, how should I handle that? Should I call them out on it, or you know, does that does that backfire? Yeah, so that's a great point. And, it, and I think you're right. It, the whole idea, the whole theme here is that our words matter and it doesn't matter which form it is. It's verb, uh, you know, spoken words or written words. I, I spent my time talking today about written words, but I think what you're describing is probably a situation where something that Dr. Singh Gambir mentioned is the allyship aspect is to indicate that indeed speaking up would be the way to be an ally to the women who do their job at the front of the office. And I think there should not be any hesitation from anyone of any background. If you see it, you feel uncomfortable about it, then you indicate it. Um, there are ways to approach allyship, which we didn't talk about today, but um, uh, there are ways to be able to approach allyship in terms of the steps to be able to sort of identify it. So you state that, hmm, that's an interesting choice of words to, to note it. And you can indicate, well, what exactly did you mean by that? If you, if you are in a position and you wish to engage in a discussion or dialogue about it, then that would be one way to go. Alternatively, you just offer, in this case, a very straightforward response to say, hmm, that's an interesting choice of words. Maybe we should refer to them as the women or whatever the role is, in fact, might be more accurate even, right? To say that they're the women at the front of the office, are they the secretaries? We should refer to them as the secretaries at the front of the office who are doing their job for us because they're part of the team, right? Um, so are, there are different ways to do so, but I think the bottom line here is to be an ally um, and to step in and to identify it because it's very possible that the people who said it did not mean for it to be demeaning or uh, mean or whatever. It's just that that implicit bias and that sort of mannerism may have been something that just sort of, they didn't really notice it for a long time until now. I love that, thank you. And thank you for that great question. Even for women in medicine, sometimes allyship means standing 
together for other women in medicine. So thank you for that. Dr. Lee, I wanted to turn it over to you uh, and ask so if you had any I, questions. I, um, so um, Javier, you spoke about how to change the thinking of your institution. How do you recommend, I mean, all of us, I can see there's people from all over, you know, private practice, uh, hospitals, academic places. How do you change the, um, the, I guess what I'm trying to say is the, what the institution had moving forward to promote DEI and um, equity, gender equity in medicine? A great question. I think it's a two way channel. So it starts first from the leadership. Uh, and so leadership, is should have DEI plus should have our woman colleagues and then it should because the leadership brings the change and mm -hmm. that's how the transformation happens uh, and strong leadership is very important to bring any change to engage because if the leadership is uh, not having the vision of where we should be the engagement will always be uh, will not be coming through uh, first response, it will be, you know, pushing through. So the leadership matters. That's, that's what I, my opinion is. And for, for people that don't have um, this kind of leadership, how do you recommend that you get this started? So I Without think, getting in trouble. <laughs> starting, I think it's a good way to start is having peer to peer mentoring, having a peer group. Uh, I think that's the best way to start if there is, uh, if we have roadblocks, uh, because I think that will help to engage colleagues and that may be, you know, men and women and to share experiences and to start a movement. Great answer. Thank you. Does anyone from the audience have any questions? We don't want to hog up all the voice. I just wanted to say that both the talks were really great. Um, I, I really enjoyed hearing about the stereotyping language. I think that's something that um, isn't frequently talked about. Um, and uh, I, uh, as being one of Dr. Gambier's mentees, um, you know, he's been, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but, you know, there's six out of the eight chiefs are females, and he's helped to mentor each of us, and particularly me and Dr. Suhail. He's been super supportive. Um, you know, we had this uh, idea about starting this women in residency support group. And, you know, he kind of helped us to kind of reach uh, different people and even present for NYACP, which was really awesome. So, of course, we appreciate that. And that webinar is um, preserved in our, in our chapter website in perpetuity. So if you want to go back and watch it, it really is an amazing webinar. And um, we did great job. And um, I know that's how I met Dr. Uh, Gambier. He ran over to me and he said, um, I want to be involved in your project. So well, I think it is now 604. So we will wrap it up. Um, if we could get your slides. I know this is recorded, but if we could get your slides and then we'll email it to everybody because there were a lot of really good resources on it. Um, all right. So everyone have a great evening. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we welcome your feedback about other topics um, of women in medicine. And we thank you so much to Dr. Gambier and Dr. Leong for joining us this evening. And thank you to Dr. Sigar too, and Karen, and everybody at New York ACP. Have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Bye-bye.